Okay, so I think we have a quorum and more here. Glad everyone can join us for tonight. My name is Keisha Rogers, and I want to welcome you to our Monday strategic update for LaRouche Pack. I'm and I'm going to be joined by my friend and colleague Michael Steger. And so what we will be discussing tonight is the question of what has just transpired in understanding that the globalist and the British Empire are going all out with their policy for destroying the United States. And they're using their deranged puppet in the White House, Joe Biden, to push through their insane policy. As we discussed and sent out in terms of the topic of this discussion tonight, what we're going to take up is the question of Biden's new world order looks more like Orwell's 1984. And as we get into that in the discussion, I think Michael's going to really lay out some of the precedent to what we're looking at right now. I think it's important, first of all, if people didn't hear the insane remarks prior to going to, to Europe by, by Joe Biden, he very much indicated that this was not just another one of Biden's insane gaffes and you know slip of the tongues, but it really highlights the danger that we're in the midst of right now as Biden and his controllers are going for full-scale regime change. And one of the latest articles on the LaRouche Pack website, which I'll highlight here, is entitled Permanent War, Permanent Revolution, a Foreign War, a Foreign War Against a Domestic en Enemy. Um, prior to going to Europe, you had Biden blurting out that he was going to Europe to do a new world order. In Brussels, he stated, and I quote, and this has been picked up by a, a lot of people and should be very alarming to anyone who is thinking about the future of our nation and the future of mankind. Uh, the quote is, it's going to be real. Biden said at a news conference in Brussels, quote, the price of the sanctions is not in, just imposed upon Russia, it's imposed upon an awful lot of countries as well, including European countries and our country as well. And he also, in, in that discussion and press conference, uh, talked about what's going to happen in terms of, as we already know, the ongoing food crisis, how this is going to impact everyone. So the question to be asked is, if you know that your actions are not just supposedly going to uh, hurt Russia, then why do you think it is that you're going to actually stop a war by going after Russia? Well, this is not, this is exactly what they're not trying to do. They're not trying to stop the war. They're actually trying to provoke more, as a matter of fact, what the provocations are, are, as I said before, for a regime change uh, and to, as uh, Biden also stated clearly, the intention is to take out Vladimir Putin. And in that course, it is for the globalists right now, they know that their system is finished, that they're not going to be able to continue with the policies as we are witnessing a mass strike or a mass mobilization movement amongst the American people that we have to keep going. And this is what the role of LaRouche Pack is going to, is extremely important in recognizing we are laying out the foundation for the solutions to put an end to this system of globalization, but from the standpoint of advancing sovereign nation states. I, I do want to bring this into the picture as well. The way we're doing that, one is through our campaign to abolish the Fed and create a third national bank. And one of the things I want to bring to people's attention is that um, we, a number of us participated in the Senate District Conventions in Texas. And 
We did a lot of work organizing to get a resolution passed to go to the state convention in Texas. And this is what we're going to be using to escalate our campaign across the country. Uh, we introduced it into a number of different Senate districts. And we know for sure one Senate district passed uh, as well as others that we're learning about uh, the language that was adopted and is now going to be going to the uh, Texas State Convention is reads as follows in the final, be it resolved, says uh, on the third national bank, uh, excuse me, we support the abolition of the Federal Reserve and the creation of a constitutional third national bank of the United States based on a gold reserve foundation focused on investing in the industrial, agricultural, and infrastructural growth of our nation. So pretty straightforward there. And I think it's extremely important that in the midst of the policy being enacted by the insane Biden administration to, as we've said several times, completely reverse what President Trump had intended through his policy for manufacturing, industrial development, making the United States a, manuf a manufacturing superpower, the MAGA program, America First program, that that is what the globalists who are, uh, and also that's what, uh, as Tony Pappard in his article that I just pointed out to you, uh, makes very clear that they're out to totally destroy and, and bring down and this has been done since 2018 when the House of Lords put out a report calling for the end of President Donald Trump and that under no circumstances should he be reelected. And this is uh, at the same time what the House of Lords was definitely putting out to make sure uh, the operations run against him uh, were escalated. So, so with that, uh, finally, I want to say that the course of what uh, Joe Biden made clear in terms of the food shortages, fuel shortages, everything that we're seeing as and as a result of the sanctions, that this is no uh, hands down. This is exactly a part of what they want to do to continue the Build Back Better green agenda. And uh, it, was, uh, it was interesting because earlier today I was listening to a uh, discussion, the, the NASA press conference on the state of NASA. And outside of talking about some very interesting exploration and developments of what's gonna be happening with the space program and the Artemis program, which we should be excited about, uh, one of the things that it was <laughs> made very clear in terms of the direction of the space program uh, in looking back at Earth was to promote the green uh, agenda, the Green New Deal. And the only thing that they were continuing to talk about is how we have to go with total mitigation strategies. What does that mean? Well, stop eating. Uh, if we have climate change problems, stop breathing, stop eating. Uh, we need to mitigate. We need to keep people, uh, uh, keep people from being able to advance industrially. So this is what's being pushed and it should definitely be addressed as a real propaganda warfare to destroy the United States. And they're hell bent on doing it and we're out to stop them. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Michael to continue the discussion. All right. Thanks, Keisha. OK, um, well, thanks, for everyone, for attending, participating um, in these weekly discussions. Um, as I think most, of, if not all of us on this call know, um, we had a certain focus and trajectory over the last number of months prior to the, the, the most recent four weeks. Um, and I would say that I would categorize that discussion as one that was focused on the building up of a political army in the United States. That what is most apparently necessary 
for our country and for the world is to have the grassroots and kind of patriotic uprising that's taking place throughout the country, independent. There's no necessary, necessarily central focus. Trump certainly is, has played a, a leading role in catalyzing it. Um, but its cohesion, its coherence is something kind of intrinsic to the culture of the United States in, in many ways. Um, and is to build up a strategic focus and awareness within that process. And in that context, we deployed into, we were deploying into grassroots meetings, into candidates events, um, raising a kind of strategic awareness on the necessity of a, of a renewed constitutional government. That is the war. It's not, we're not defining the terms in that way. Those are the physical terms of the war. Those are the terms of the war the enemy itself sees. Um, and what you saw with the persecution of people that have participated in January 6th, what you see with Biden's own personal obsession with Trump and the idea of declaring, like we saw with Trudeau, that a people uprising are, are somehow Nazis, not worthy of the dignity of citizenry or free speech. Trudeau himself, as many of you probably saw, was denounced in Canada as anathema to these, these values, basically a, a dictator type of, of condemnation. Um, is that this political army is the most important question and its substance, its capability of leading. President Trump will be in Michigan here where I am uh, this Saturday. Uh, there's already been press coverage. This is a major battleground for that question. There is a very clear focus from a number of these grassroots groups to purge the rhinos, to purge the neocons. We saw about seven members of the House of Representatives take up this message when they declared that opposition to this massive funding of Ukraine. Marjorie Taylor Greene, to her credit, has an article in uh, a website, American Greatness, saying that we are under Joe Biden's program for Ukraine, we are going to see hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people die because of food shortages around the world, and potentially even in the United States. Um, as much as, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene is a new person to the political scene, she, is, she has captured the moral essence of this current system. Um, so in that context, it's worth to note that we've had to transition and take note of um, a, a certain kind of change in the dynamic. But I want to premise these discussion tonight that the change, this war in Ukraine, is targeting that this patriotic movement in the United States. Um, and so our re continued focus remains, how do we continue to elevate, educate, and impassion that movement, um, and continue to think of, of renewing our deployments and engagement with these kinds of activities, because there is literally nothing more important today than that kind of engagement. So I want to just briefly touch on the situation in Ukraine. Um, as was stated by a number of leading Russian figures, including military, their Ministry of Defense, over this past weekend, their intention has been to liberate the Donbass, the two provinces, the Donetsk and Luhansk, um, of Nazis and any military threats. The first stage, which they say they have resolved, will be was to eliminate any ability to resupply the Ukrainian armed forces, much of which are Nazi right-wing brigades like the Azov Battalion or uh, Pravi Sector, um, uh, from any kind of resupply. And you've got, let's be honest, you've got a massive war grifting. You've got American liberals sending money into Ukraine um, blindly just throwing money. We, Biden announced a billion dollars. Biden is just absurdly incompetent, out of touch, senile in every way. He contradicts himself. His White House contradicts himself. There's complete chaos at the helm of this 
of this so-called program, all, all of it probably by design. But the Russians have secured much of Ukraine. They've made it clear that any mercenaries or resupply routes or uh, ammunition depots, even in the far western part of Ukraine, would be clearly targeted, even potentially outside of Ukraine, if that be became necessary by the Russian perspective. Um, uh, mercenaries will not be given the uh, POW status. Um, and they've basically secured that characteristic. I'm just giving you a sense of what the Russians de declared over the weekend. They're now going to be moving. Um, they've pinned down various Ukrainian military forces from what they've described, and they're now moving into the southeast of Ukraine uh, to deal with the 40 to 60,000 uh, size uh, division divisions in the southeast. Probably the most intense fighting is in Mariupol which was where the Azov Battalion and other extreme right-wing brigades, Nazi brigades, had positioned themselves approximately eight years ago. That all seems consistent with what we're seeing on the ground, that the, the Russians were not bogged down. They were, they, they were not prevented from bombing Kiev, um, that they are doing what they intended. They are securing the entire province. The line of engagement was largely about was splitting the provinces in half um, prior to this intervention by Russia, and um, I think to a large extent they're going to they're going to secure all of the provinces, and so now we're seeing that that type of deployment. Um, it's probably true. I wouldn't be surprised given. Putin's and Russia's current cultural orientation. The Eastern Orthodox is April 24th, a week later than the Western. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a certain change of the type of engagements as early as then, which is about four weeks away. Um, so that's where that probably stands. With, besides all the other blustering and types of maniacal calls for no-fly zones, or retaliation by using chemical weapons. These are the things that have been happening. It's just psychotic. Um, and it's, it's this failed leadership in the West, in the United States, but predominantly in Europe. So I wanna touch on something. So that's a, a quick review. The main subject of the discussion tonight, I think has to be a much deeper uh, penetration. At least I would like to introduce something of a much broader characteristic to see if that opens up um, more discussion. So if people, people may know, we posted it on the website. Last Wednesday, uh, a few of us here in Detroit had a chance to go up to an event at Michigan State University. We were a co-sponsor for a, an event by Turning Point with Dr. Dr. Scott Atlas. And it was attended by about 250 young people from the campus. I thought full room, well attended. Um, and perhaps the most salient point Dr. Atlas made in a, pro in a private discussion prior to the event was that COVID was not the crisis. COVID merely exposed the crisis. That the real crisis is the kind of corruption, apathy, um, lack of, of scientific thought and leadership within our institutions directly, public health, government more generally, universities, media, that for many of us, who, or many of him, people like him, who had thought they had co maintained confidence in the institutions, they had risen well and had significant careers. He's a, um, I think a neuropathologist, uh, a neuroradiologist, excuse me, um, at Stanford, and thought the institutions to some extent had been working. And what he was confronted with was their utter failure. At that event, um, there was some engagement with some young people, one of which was, was a journalist or associated with the campus newspaper. And he asked a question, which I thought provided an important insight into the dialogue or the, an approach to how we think and the, the nature of the problem of college education more broadly. He said, what's your ideology? He came up to our table and he asked, what's your ideology? Well, I think we could probably sum up the ideology of Lyndon LaRouche, LaRouche Pack in one very clear precept. 
The one ideological outlook we have is that we are opposed to ideologies. Now, um, why, is that, why is that so important? Because much of what, of our political discussion, and let me put that in a more specific way, our ability as a people in this country amidst a major political and cultural war cannot be restricted in our discussions to ideological perspectives, whether the rejection of them or their adoption. We have to be based on an unknowable principles. You might say we have to be devoted to the physics of a characteristic. That means we're not consu consumed by popular opinion or statistical arguments or trends or an ideological structure. We're committed to what's knowable, what's true. You might say some in the religious terms, you might call it God's will, but that that will is knowable as Paul you know, ma ma maintains in Romans. And I, so I wanna go back just briefly then to what we discussed last week, um, just to kind of reintroduce this concept. So I showed this image last week and the, the nature of it is that what most people operate from, whether it's in physical science or in politics or culture, is that it's the mass of the phenomena which is governing the dynamic. Um, that it's the, uh, the general accumulation. In social terms, we might consider that popular opinion. That whatever, wherever the population is moving is what's going to govern the course of the, the physical process. So if we all accept that we should wear masks, then masks will somehow have value would be the, the, the kind of the, the, taking the argument to the absurd, right? But it works economically. It works in terms of social media, or it works in terms of apps and social and, and kind of the Silicon Valley program. If a bunch of people use Twitter, then it has value. If a bunch of people don't, Twitter has no significant value. Unlike wheat production or iron production or electricity production, even if no one uses it, or doesn't use it in the best way possible, it has huge potential. Now you could maybe argue Twitter does too as a social platform and so on, but it's, I think we get the, we get the basic idea. It's, it's, a different, it's a different question of intrinsic value versus socially adopted value. That merely out of popular opinion, you can govern a direction. But it also exists with how we think about the way that the universe functions. Now, some people, and this is true with the era we've been living in, um, and I'm gonna, I'll touch on that in a second, you know, this liberal era, this post-Cold War liberalism, oftentimes now referred to as globalism, where there's no nation states, there's really all there is is the individual and its rights and its economic interests and it's and it's it's the commitment of the, the 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 state or government or governance to allow that individual to live as however it might want to live however you want to that's what ultimately when it comes down to it that's so if it's a pedophilia fine right as we see with the current supreme court justice but it's to enable people to live as however they want to that people build up an ideological structure. So you can take, you can say, instead of just popular opinion, we'll say it's not just the earth, which is governing the physical dynamic or the sun, um, so say for our solar system. It's not just the mass of our sun, but there's some statistical law, some ideological structure. For, 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 the, for the British empiricists at the time, in the 17th century, this became Newton's inverse square law, that really it's just a statistical characteristic. This statistic that when bodies are 
but as the bodies grow in size and mass, they have a greater power of attraction. Now, where that power came from, Newton had no idea. And nobody else does to this day. Um, it just worked statistically. From the standpoint of the degree of observations that we had, we're able to hold it consistent. I can tell you right now, if you, if you look at the extremes of astrophysics, you look at there's a massive black holes in the center of every galaxy, all of the Newtonian physics are beginning to break down. The observations have now surpassed any ability for the statistical metric to hold. So there's rumblings of the ideological structure. And the tendency is to build up more ideological structure. So I'm diving into this in more depth than last week. But the point last week and the point this week remains the same. Instead of assuming whether you just operate from gross pragmatism, it's just popular opinion where people go, or you set up an ideological structure, you're still assuming that the mass of bodies is what governs gravitational fields. Rather than recognizing that the human mind has access to the characteristic of principles and that the principles, these unseen, you might say dimensions, unperceived with the senses, and yet still knowable through hypothesis, are the causal force of such things as say, the formations of planetary systems, of stars, even of galaxies. And that what we're ascertaining in the course of science are these principles. That these principles are the actual physics not merely the observation of activity per se, or aggregating that activity into some statistical ideology. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing, but hopefully that just introduces this concept a little bit more in depth into relating how we think about the physical universe determines how we think about and provide an alternative to the current situation today. As Keisha mentioned, we are dealing with a real, real kind of state. Well, I would put it, we're dealing with a satanic force that Biden has clearly been in, engaged in for the last 50 years in the, in the kind of corrosive perversions of Washington, D.C. over that period of time, over this kind of dominance of neoliberalism and globalism. And that is leading right now because of a lack of leadership because of the kind of destructive force similar to what we saw with Obama. And really, Obama was really the basis of everything Biden's doing today. All of the gross hypocrisies and contradictions um, were really introduced into American political culture through Obama. And it's not surprising that you saw the same thing, you know, in that award show last night, um, where this kind of violent gangster mentality has affected every aspect of American culture. This kind of, and then at the same time, the weeping liberal. Um, we are dealing, we are threatened with a major increased economic crisis, food shortages, gas shortages, skyrocketing prices. You could, pro you could say that approximately 50% of the US economy is financialized. And that may be giving too much credit, but to a large extent, you might say 50% of the American people are still engaged in some level of physical activity, even if it's basic, low level um, activity. But at least 50% of the US economy is financialized. That means suspect that if the popular winds of, of opinion change, if no longer people are committed to the popular acceptance of a rising stock market, a rising real estate prices, into the, if the Federal Reserve no longer continues to bail out all buyers of last resort, then we could, see, we could see even more severe economic shocks than any of us have seen before. That's certainly there, that is plausible today. And so it, I think we take a step back because none of this is really that surprising. We've seen this kind of threat We've known that it exists. It can be very frightening. But to make the point that the United States was never based on an ideology. 
it was always constructed from principle. And those principles were somewhat discovered and unfolded in the course of the United States as a nation. The beginnings of the Plymouth and Massachusetts colonies took concepts out of the Renaissance, out of the Reformation, which was largely to a large extent made the, the, the early Christian writings available to the masses in their, their own language. And that these things were beginning to be adopted with the idea of self-government, with the consent of the governed, with higher responsibilities of citizenry. But that was never disconnected from the physical, productive, and economic aspects of a society. And from that, you saw with Benjamin Franklin and the leadership like Alexander Hamilton, these higher conceptions of banking, of currency, something that had been developed and played with in the early colonies, but now became an integral part of this, the strength of a new nation. This idea of not building up based on ideologies and in response to that, in response to what Abraham Lincoln introduced, which was a consolidation of these concepts of physical advancement, of cultural and moral uh, commitments as a society, as a nation, a devotion and commitment, not a, not a, a, a preaching or a worshiping of ideological doctrines like we saw within the Middle Ages and in previous periods. Not a, not a total gross pragmatism, not a reduction of most of the population to beasts, a recognition that there was something profound about the individual but that life and our nation were not based on doing whatever you wanted to do. And the way you encouraged others to do that was to do it however you wanted to. Now, when you think of that liberalism, which is the very precept of it, it hands psychopaths and sociopaths, which might just be one or 2% of the population, the, the ability to become dominant factors within your society. And that's exactly what people like Jeremy Bentham were sociopaths, psychopaths, Bernard Mandeville, the hellfire clubs that Benjamin Franklin intervened into. That British liberalism was a construct specifically in response to the American culture in the middle of the 18th century, 1740s, 1750s. It was always meant to undermine the United States and replace this cultural outlook that had been developed, this commitment towards advancement, and that one's value to society was in what one could contribute to the overall productive advancement of the society. That could be through teaching, through religious or profound moral insight and direction and guidance, military leadership, industry, you know, found ironworks and foundries, farming, developing new land or territory, exploration, scientific thought into electricity or materials or astronomy in the broader universe. That instead of that commitment, it became what one was interested in doing. Now at the core, what we've seen over the last 150 years, 130 years, has been the increasing dominance of British liberalism. Because after Abraham Lincoln, there was a commitment. There was a commitment to then replace the British imperial system with ideologies entirely, not just to subvert or attempt to undermine the American cultural fabric and maybe and hopefully tear it apart as we saw with the attempted civil war. In some ways they launched, when the British lost the civil war, they, un, they, they launched the uncivil war, a war of ideological doctrines. That's, where, that's what socialism is. That's what Marxism is. It's premised on British li liberalism entirely. Socialism devolved into something even more severe with communism in Russia, something that even the better socialists opposed. 
That communism created the conditions for an extreme reaction, which then was sponsored again by British liberals as fascism. So you hear all this discussion, all this sense of uh, you know, liberalism. This is what an argument that was made at the end of the Cold War, that liberalism has now prevailed over fascism in World War II and now communism in the Cold War. Liberalism is the great reigner, the great victory, vict uh, victor of ideological, you know, experiment of mankind. What a gross manipulation. What just, what fraud. That what we're looking at is a question of, are we going to restore that deeper principled Christian, Judeo-Christian culture that's universal in its highest form? It's not predicated or particular to the Christian religion. And it's based on a sense that each of us has an opportunity to contribute something and that the importance of a nation, of a government, is to strengthen and ennoble our ability to make those contributions, to make our life worth something. This idea, this idea that governs the very creation and deployment and strength of our nation and the strength of this patriotic uprising, which is by itself non-ideological. It looks to principle and it lives. As, it, as the saying goes, you live and die by the sword. If we do not revive this sense of, of principle, of discovery, of the power of the human mind, we will die by that sword. We will die by a lack of, re, of, of a revival of a unique American culture. This idea is what terrifies our enemy the most, that we see through all the veils and fogs of ideological arguments. And we recognize there's something profoundly true about the immortality of the human soul and the creator of the universe and our relationship to that dynamic. And that that's best expressed, whether it's in Beethoven's compositions or in the greatest scientific discovery through the domain of principle not ideological fabrications or structures, formal structures. So I would say this is at the core of the cultural fight we're waging. Um, and I would say that this is something that we have to look to revive today. Because if we do, even if it's a small band of us, if we have that kind of commitment, then all of the cheap attempts to control this patriotic uprising will fail and that we will actually begin to reestablish an American cultural outlook, which has been waning, which has been, we have been losing in its intensity, um, at least since the 1870s and 1880s. And certainly by the turn of the 20th century. And if we're going to win this war, it's a revival of that question, of this higher United States, this higher aspect of our civilization that operates independent of false doctrines and ideologies and looks to the course of discovery. It lets the future and our discoveries and potential in the future govern us. From that standpoint, from the standpoint I've just described, you then see the clear advantages of what a national bank provides. That a national bank and banking system provides access to act upon that con concept of the future. That we say, what discoveries do we need to make? Let's embolden our population. Let's ask our young people to make these discoveries, make these advancements, make these technological breakthroughs so we can advance as a civilization and as a nation. And that we can have a national dialogue from that context, from that standpoint, with that mission. And so this is, this is how we, we begin to wage real cultural warfare because it's, it's nothing less than what we're facing. It's an existential fight. Um, better aspects of perhaps the Russian intelligentsia are aware of this, partly because Lyndon LaRouche personally briefed them. <laughs> um, the same is true even within some layers in China, though it's, I think less, it's less substantial, but still there. It's true in India. It's true in many countries, Italy, Argentina. Elements of this have been briefed. This was really one of the core messages Lyndon LaRouche took to the rest of the world, the true United States and the real fight against 
an empire which will construct a series of ideologies. I mean, whether you take Francis Bacon, John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, uh, Georg Hegel, all of them were apologists for empire, all of them. Few of the so-called purported philosophers taught in Western canon were anything but paid agents of an imperial doctrine. There are very few that were actually elevated to the quality of real thinkers and true patriots. Um, and much of which is to confuse and disorient these kinds of moments, these critical junctures that are attempting to move us away from so-called globalism, right? There's a discussion today that we need to deglobalize. This is coming from the British Empire directly from Chatham House. All of this is an ideological structure. The question for us is, are we going to revive that real sense? What I would say that the true meaning of the immortality of the human soul that Plato and Socrates captured 2,500 years ago. Can we bring that to bear? Because that's the, the, the principal basis of our Declaration of Independence. That was the living culture of Abraham Lincoln and his fight to secure the union above all else. So that's a bit more elevated and maybe more broad than we're usually in discussion about, but I think it's really the, the nature at the heart of the current discussion. So I'll leave it there and, and see what you guys are thinking.